We are in John 21, and I am grieved. Why? Because we're coming to the end of the Gospel of John. I love teaching through the book of John. Uh, different from the synoptics in that the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Gospel of John, 90% is all new material, but John very clearly, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing to prove to all of us beyond a shadow of a doubt, Christ is Lord, right? That Jesus Christ is God. He's king. And I love the book of John. Whenever I'm at a place where I need to be refreshed and encouraged, I just start reading through the gospel of John once again. So it grieves me that we're leaving here. I'm excited about going into the book of Acts. I don't know that uh, at this stage in my life whether I'll ever get back to teaching John again in an expositional fashion. You know how long it takes to teach through a book. So I don't think I have that much time any longer, you know. <laughs> so it does grieve me that we're ending the gospel. Now, last week we began, to, we broached into the 21st chapter. It would be how many times now has the Lord appeared to them since his crucifixion? How many times? The resurrection Christ? <laughs> Resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ since his crucifixion have been three, three. One in the upper room and we're all gathered together, right? And he showed them his hands, his side. He wished them shalom, peace, peace with God our Father, peace of God, peace in God. That's what we all need is to mature in that peace that God offers us, not like the world, Right? But then there was somebody there who wasn't uh, present and said, I doubt it. Who was that? Thomas. Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? And so he appeared a second time to them when Thomas was there. And he said, come here, Thomas. I don't, I don't want you doubting. I want you believing. And God never wants us to be in doubt, although there are times when we question things, don't you? Yeah, sure, surely you do. You just got to dig a little deeper into the text and the truth will be revealed. But God doesn't want you to doubt. He wants you to believe. And so he said to Thomas, Thomas, come here, see. The holes in my hands, here. Put your hand in my side. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. One of those definitive statements of the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, he had given them some instructions to obey, right? Post-resurrection, what were they supposed to be doing? Waiting. Waiting, Waiting where? Galilee. Waiting in the Galilee. We read that several times. They go before me to the Galilee to a mountain that I will show you. <clears throat> do we find them in the mountain? No. no. Where do we find them? Oh, fishing. Fishing. When a man doesn't know what else to do, it's a good thing to do is just go fishing. <laughs> Uh, so we find them in disobedience, not doing what God had commanded them to do. But yet God is so merciful and so gracious, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can relate. Can you not relate? Yeah, yeah. And whenever we're in disobedience, it's not profitable, is it? We're, we're, our lives are not productive. They're not enriched in any way. And I'm talking about the enrichment of a relationship that we have with the Lord. The riches, the riches that we have in our relationship one to another, that's what results from our obedience to the Lord more than anything else, you see. But then when God spoke to them, Jesus, from the shore, and he said, fellas, you catch any fish? And they said, no, no. no. <laughs> that's all, just one answer, no. <laughs> oh, it's miserable being in that place, isn't it? Too much of Jesus to be happy in the world, too much of the world to be happy in Jesus. And, and that's where they were. They, should, they weren't supposed to be out in that boat fishing on the sea. They were supposed to be waiting on the mountaintop for the Lord and his visitation to them once again. But he's so gracious. He says, cast your net on the right side. You're fishing on the wrong side of the boat, as if that's going to make a difference, right? The difference isn't where they cast their net. The difference was who was providing the fish that miraculous catch, right? And so when they're in obedience to the Lord, what's the result? <sighs> so many fish, they couldn't pull the net in, right? Yeah, and then they get to shore, but John says, 
Peter, what? It's the Lord. And Peter jumps in, but he first puts his coat on to jump in the water. We wouldn't do that, would we? Whose swimming trunks are those? Hmm. I, I hope they weren't swimming without them. <laughs> but he put his coat on because he wanted to be modest before the Lord. He didn't want the Lord to see him in his loincloth because that's the way they would fish, his speedo, you know. <laughs> no, he put his coat on and he swam to the shore so excited for a moment. What did Peter forget? His guilt, his shame, oh, his deep regret and sorrow. Hmm. For a moment in his excitement of seeing the Lord, that all evaporated away, but just for a moment. When he comes to the shore, and Jesus is so gracious, so loving, so compassionate, he has breakfast cooked for them. Breakfast at the seaside, right? Now, at this point in their lives, they've become born again, right? Because the second visitation, post-resurrection, he breathed on them and he said, Receive ye now, Numa Hegasune, Ruk Hagodesh, the spirit of holiness, the breath of God, right? And they were born again at that time. Remember I spoke to you about how the Holy Spirit works in our life as believers. First, he is the parakaletos. Para, alongside, kaletos, call. Called alongside, called alongside to each one of us to open up our eyes, our minds, our hearts to the reality of who Jesus really is. That's how that happened, you know. You didn't do that. You weren't seeking God. God saw you. Hmm? And then as we have that para experience with the Holy Spirit, as he begins to open up our eyes, just as Jesus was walking with his disciples for how long? Three years, the better part of three years, opening up their understanding, their eyes, their hearts, their minds, the reality of who Jesus was. Now, now it comes to that place where the Holy Spirit is going to dwell within them. Because he's going to be leaving. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I go away, I'm going to send another helper. One of the same kind is, is what's being spoken of there in the Greek grammar. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is who he would send. Not limited to any geographical location, was he? No, he could be everywhere at once. Psalm 139 declares, where can I go from your spirit? Where? Every place that exists. God is. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is equally God, as Jesus is God, as God the Father is God, one being, three essence, right? One being, three persons. The omnipresence of the Spirit. Now, and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, some commentators don't think anything happened. I think that's preposterous, that's ridiculous, that's absurd. The Lord of heaven and earth, the king of the universe, says receive something and you're not going to receive anything? No. So we know what happened at that moment in time? They were born again, born from above. Their spirit was quickened, awakened to the person of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit dwells within them. Being a Christian means that the Holy Spirit resides within you. Being a South Carolinian, I reside in South Carolina. Being a former New Yorker, when I was up there, I was a New Yorker because I lived in New York. Being a Californian, you live in California. Being a Christian, you live in? Yeah. Well, you should anyway, right? But that's the problem today. We have a lot who have his name attached to them, but not his person, not his spirit. So they became born again, quickened from above. But he said, now there's more that I want to do in your life. Not only do I want you to display the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. the law of the Spirit, which is love. love. The way of the Spirit, which is love. faith, hope, love. love. These three, but the greatest of these. Love. How will they know you're my disciples? By your love, 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 love. love. And when someone is indwelt with the Spirit of God, which should be the chief character of their life, is the chief attribute of our God, which is love. love. He who knows not love knows not 
Because God is. Are we getting it? <laughs> I need to get more and more of an understanding so I can let myself go to allow him to love through me as he desires to. And so that's, he said, wait now and tarry until you're endued with power from on high, from the Holy Spirit. Power to do what? To speak in tongues? To act like some religious nut? A charismaniac? No. To fulfill 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What, what is that chapter called? Love. The love chapter. Faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these three, love. And if I have not love, it profit me Nothing. Nothing. Doesn't matter how much I know. Doesn't matter how wise I am. Doesn't matter how much I give away of myself, my resources. None of that matters if it's not motivated by love. Love is a tremendous motivator, isn't it? Yeah. And so he's displaying the compassion and the love of God, which is an unconditional, sacrificial love. Completely undeserved, completely unmerited by any of them, right? You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, from the scriptures alone, by the grace alone to the glory of God alone, right? The five solas of the Reformation. But let's talk about Peter for a minute. So he got to the shore, and he's there with the, the other six. There were seven of them that day. Six of them were fishermen. One was not. That was Thomas. He wasn't really a fisherman. Why did they go back fishing? I'm sorry? Peter was absolutely distressed, in despair. He felt like he was pond scum. What's pond scum good for? Nothing to be avoided. Fish dung at the bottom of the Sea of the Galilee. Absolutely good for nothing felt completely inadequate, helpless, weak, pathetic. Have you ever felt that way? For me, it's usually Monday mornings. After I've tried to deliver a message, oh, who is sufficient for these things? That's what Paul said. If he wasn't sufficient, well, this donkey certainly isn't sufficient, right? Speaking of that, can we pray one more time? Because, Lord, I, I have to confess, I am completely dependent upon your Holy Spirit for anything and everything that would be done for the increase of your kingdom and for the good of your people here this morning. So, Lord, you break the bread of your word, Lord, by speaking to our minds and our hearts, by giving us a revelation and understanding of the text, Lord. You, Lord Jesus, be our teacher, our mentor. As I've said so many times before, Lord, what I am not, make me. What I have not, give me. What I know not, teach me, Lord. And all of us, Lord. So that that which we receive from you, we can impart to others, Lord. And Lord, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't offer a prayer for my sister, Cheryl, and for my brother, Hank. Ask that you would just so be with them. So wrap your arms around them, Lord, and hold them close. And We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you that disease, sickness, death is a manifestation of your grace for us who believe. I, I don't want to be here and remain in this place, in this body forever. No, no, no. Ready to give it up. So we thank you, Lord, that you would not allow us to live in an eternal state of sin. Thank you, Jesus. That one day, one day, not only are we justified, but we are being sanctified. And one day, one day, we are absolutely assured that we will be glorified together with you and everyone that we love forever and ever and ever, never to be separated. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. And everyone agreed with me who said, amen, amen. Peter, uh, I've, I've, you know why we love Peter so much? We're just like him. <laughs> in so many ways, 
impulsive, impetuous. Oh, my dear, I'm so much like a Peter. I'd like to be more of a John, you know. But I have had those experiences where I felt so inadequate, so useless, wishing, God, let me go back to my old life. I wasn't so miserable because I didn't know I was disappointing you then. I didn't know I wasn't fulfilling your will and your plan in my life then, Lord. And that's why they went fishing. And it was Peter's idea, wasn't it? He said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life. I, I'm no good to God. I'm no good to any of you. I'm no good to anyone except going into that sea and catching fish. That's who I am. I'm a fisherman. But Jesus made it clear. No, no, no. You'll no longer be fishers of fish. But you're going to be fishers of men. Men. And so Peter had no business going back there to fish. But he, he led the others in that disobedience, didn't he? And, and I've told you before, we've got to be very, very careful. We can all have down moments. We can all have times when we're depressed or distressed. You know, I, I just can't stand it every time I go to the doctor. They ask me, are you depressed? Are you suicidal? I said, why would I be? I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to heaven. And I start an explanation, and they say, follow me to room three. <laughs> you know. But, but it happens to all of us, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah, we just don't want, we don't want to make any bad decisions, and we surely don't want to influence any others in those bad decisions, do we? But that's what happened. But God is so merciful. When he called from the shore and wanted to know if they caught any fish, how did he refer to them? Children. Children. Hey, boys, children. Catch any fish? Why? You're acting like children now. You're not doing what I told you to do. But God is restoring them. And what God wants us to understand more than anything else is our purpose in life. Our purpose in life. Listen, have anybody been wondering what your purpose is? None of you are being honest. I don't see a single hand. Okay, there you go. Very good. Our purpose is to know him and make him known. To know him is to love him. To love him is to serve him. And we serve him by serving his body. His body. Turn with me for a moment to Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're going to be back in John 21, but I just want to take a little walk through the scriptures for a minute. Chapter 5, we have the record of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue that God gave to Moses. The first four commandments deal with our relationship to God. God, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The next six deal with our relationship to one another, right? When Jesus was asked the question by the lawyer, they want to trip him up, which is the greatest of all the commandments of the, of the Lord? And what did he say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The Bible correctly assumes your real problem is your love self, right? That's, that's my real problem, my love of self. I need to learn to love God and others. But look at, look at chapter 5, and in particular verse 10. But showing mercy, God showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Look over at chapter 6, the Shema. Shema simply means here, right? This is the Shema of Israel. Shema, verse 4, chapter 6, see there? Hear, O Israel, the Lord... Our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. And these which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Parents, you have a responsibility to immerse your children in a Christian worldview, a Christian culture, a Christian conscience. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house 
and on your gates. Mm. Look at chapter 7, verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord, your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who and for those who love him and keep his commandments. Look at chapter 10 for a moment. Let's pick it up in verse 12. My Bible has a heading here. It says the essence of the law. And now Israel what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways and to love him, to serve him, serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep his commandments of the Lord, his statutes, which I command you today for your good. There's not a command he gives that isn't for our good, is it? No, but we want just the opposite so often. Verse 14, indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. Chapter 11, look there for a minute. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments. Chapter 11, verse 13, what does it say? And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to what? Love the Lord your God and serve him with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And he's going to provide the latter and the, the early rains. Look at uh, verse 22 of chapter 11. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all of his ways and to hold fast to him only. Chapter 13, look there for a moment. Speaking about a prophet who would arise and encourage you to worship other gods, and that's the problem in our pagan culture. We're polytheistic. We worship a multitude of gods, but we won't worship the one true God. Hmm. But in verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God, he is testing you to know whether you Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 19. You think God's trying to drive home a point to these people? Verse 19, verse 9. If you keep all these commandments and you do them, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways, then you shall be added three more cities to your side. I will bless you, he's saying repeatedly. Over and over and over again, as God is giving the second law, that's what Deuteronomy is, the second law, he's encouraging the people to willingly come to love the Lord. Go to chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. It's a beautiful sound. You're turning the pages of your Bible. Chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, your children, your grandchildren. To do what? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. What does verse 16 say of chapter 30? In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Look at verse 20. What does it say? That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give to them. Matthew 22, go over there for a moment. New Testament echoing this same truth. This is what I quoted from just a moment ago, but I want you to see it in your Bible. Chapter 22. 
beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard, oh, I'm sorry, I'll wait till you're there. Everybody there? Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus responded by repeating the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. For this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Now go to John's gospel. Go to chapter 13. I love the consistency, the integrity of the Word of God, both Old Testament and New Testament. There's no contradiction. The same message, the love of God towards a people who really don't love him as they should. Verse 34 of chapter 13. A new commandment. I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Go to chapter 14, look at verse 15. Again, echoing the same truth that's found in Deuteronomy, the Mosaic law there. If you love me, verse 15, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that you may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, para, and will be in you, en. And I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered, and he said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Chapter 15, verse 9. Love perfected. Love produces joy. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. For this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Overarching adjective of the fruit of the Spirit is love that you may bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. Okay, now let's go to John 21. Picking up the narrative, this historical account of the reinstatement of Peter back into the ministry, into God's purposes and plans, into God's service. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, what did Jesus say? First word, Simon. Verse 16, first word, Jesus spoke, Simon. Verse 17, first word, Jesus spoke, 
Simon. Now, wait a minute. He was no longer Simon. He was Petros, Peter. Not Petra. The rock Petra is Jesus. Petros, the little rocks, that's all of us. That was Peter. Why is Jesus no longer referring to him as Peter, but Simon? The new name was Peter. Because he's acting like Simon. You're going back and acting like Simon again. Oh, boy. You know, we, 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 now this is born again Peter. This is Peter who has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Not empowered yet, not re receiving that experience of the epi of God, the empowerment for ministry, but he's born again, and he's making a clear choice to act like the old Simon rather than the new Peter. Oh, boy, that never happens to you folk, does it? Yeah. Oh, but when it does, I'm so thankful. He is so merciful. He is so forgiving. And so when the breakfast had finished, Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Did Peter's actions display, based upon what we read in Deuteronomy, what we read in John's Gospel, did Peter's actions display that he loves God, that he loves Jesus? No. Why? He wasn't obeying him. He denied him. Jesus had prophesied that that would take place. We'll look at that in a moment. He said, before the, co the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter's problem was he had a high estimation of his own strength, didn't he? Overestimating his strength, his courage, his determination, his resolve, his constitution. Underestimating the weakness of his flesh, the temptation of sin, the fear of punishment, of death, of pain. Simon, do you love me? Jesus said, more than these. Now, the question has to be asked, what are the these? The fish? You think he was talking about the fish? Now, now the fish would have been his means of providing for himself, his way of life, his 401k, his financial security, whatever you want to call it. Do you, do you love me more than your ability or your means to survive in this life? Do you love me more than possessions? Do you love me more than wealth? Maybe he was looking at the boat and the fishing nets. Do you love me more than, than what that boat represents? What did the boat represent? In boatology of the New Testament, what did the boat represent? Every time you see Jesus, your life. The first time Peter experiences Jesus, Jesus said, can I come into your, can I step into your life, Peter? Can I step in and make your life fruitful? And God spoke from that boat. And then he said to Peter, in, in gratitude for letting me step into your life, let me do something for you now that you could never do for yourself. Cast your nets. We're in, we're in the shallows. We might catch some bait fish. We ain't going to catch anything worthwhile. You stick to preaching, I'll stick to fishing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, okay, I'll prove you, I'll prove you wrong. He threw out the net, and what happened? And then when he got... Andrew and, and, and uh, or James and John to come over and help. He and Andrew, they both filled their boats with fish and they began to sink and their nets were breaking. Wow. Do you love me more than the boats, the nets, the fish? I don't think that's what he was talking about because remember, Peter made a grandiose claim when Jesus said, this night all of you will be made to stumble on account of me. And what did Peter say? They may be caused to stumble. They may deny you, Lord, but I never, I will die for you. And he said it twice. And Jesus said, really, Peter? <laughs> You'll die for me? Okay. Overestimating his own abilities, underestimating his flesh is the enemy, right? Peter, do you love me? more than these other disciples? Do you really love me more than the fish? Do you love me more than your boats and your nets? How many men find their identity in what they do? Many, many men. You know, I, I remember when I first came into the ministry, 
think it was 19, um, gosh, 1989. I was working for General Electric. I was there for 27 years. I find my identity in what I did as a spare parts manager for GE. I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed what I did. Uh, but I didn't realize how much of my identity was wrapped up in what I did rather than who I am. Then the Lord called me out of my secular occupation and to pastor full time. And for the first six months, I thought I made the biggest mistake of my life. Because, because I was just struggling to try to discover who am I now? You know. Listen, our worth is not in what we do. Our identity is in who we are. When you see somebody next time, don't ask them what do you do. Say, who are you? That's a better question. Who are you? Now, now Peter's going through this self-examination. He does not like what he's seeing. He does not like the conclusions he's coming to. Have you ever come, been in that place? Oh, boy, I have. Do you love me more than these? And what is the word that Jesus used for love here in the Greek text? Agapeo. Do you agape me? Do you agapeo? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me sacrificially? And please don't misunderstand that Greek word. There's five words for love in the Greek language. English is a beggar's language. Why? It begs for more words. The average individual uses about 20,000 words in their vocabulary, English vocabulary. The Greek text, the Greek vocabulary, it's 120,000 words. It is so expressive. So you have five different words for love in the Greek, right? And the highest form of that love is a love that's unconditional, sacrificial. You will give everything for that object of your love and affection. Everything and anything. Now, it can be good, it can be bad, okay? Some people say, well, no, that's God's love. No, 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 that's just a, a highest form of love where you're willing to sacrifice everything and anything for that which you love. Example, John 3, Jesus said, men agapeo darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. They love the evil. When men agapeo, when men love darkness unconditionally, sacrificially, They'll give anything for that object of their love. Hey, give me some examples. Drugs. Drugs. Drugs is a prime example. Do you know how many young people, 18 to 45, died of overdose last year alone? Fentanyl overdoses, 107,000. That's twice as many died in the Vietnam War in one year. You don't hear anything about that, do you? Look at the number of people who've been hooked on drugs, hooked on alcohol. And, and it will do anything. When a person is, is using and, and in a, an addiction, uh, they will use anyone and everything they can to get that which they love. Precious. Precious. Right? Yeah. That could be a person. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, you could become so infatuated with another person where all reason, all logic goes completely out the window. And you don't realize how damaging, huh? what, a, what a negative effect that relationship can have upon you. But you have this unconditional, sacrificial love where you're giving yourself. Now, that, that's a bad example of that type of love. But the best example of that, you know, I want it. I chose, love is a choice, isn't it, my dear? Yeah, how many years have we been together now? Next month it'll be how long? How long? 14 years. 14 years. And, and it's a crazy thing. This woman chose to love a stranger. Now, you didn't know me. God told you to do that. Yeah, and she chose to give me everything that she is, everything that she has in this act of love. Love, love can be a tremendous motivator, influence in our life, can it? Yeah. And the same thing was true when I chose to give myself to you, to take care of you for the rest of my life. I didn't know you. You're really a stranger to me. We got to know each other. But love, real love, happens over time as you grow in your appreciation for one another. There's romance. There's infatuation. There's lust in the beginning. But love, real love, this love we're speaking of, that only happens over time. 
That, that's the love that we should have for Jesus over time. As we come to know him more and more and more, we just willingly surrender everything we are, everything we have. Do you agape on me, Peter? And what is Peter's response? He said, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I, I, I have a fondness for you, an affection. It's obvious I don't have an unconditional love for you, sacrificial love for you. I won't sacrifice my life. I said I would, but I didn't. We'd all like to think we'd die for Jesus, wouldn't we? Yeah. But the only confidence you can have in the fact that you would die for Jesus is if you are living for him today doing everything that Deuteronomy said. Let me ask you something. How successful was Israel in obeying those commandments in Deuteronomy? There was a couple of good examples. Abraham being one. Joseph. Oh, jo There's only two men in the Old Testament that nothing negative is said about either one of them. Nothing. Who are those two men? Joseph and Daniel. Daniel. Joseph and Daniel. Now, those were two men that were given the spirit of grace and supplication of God. And they lived a life of devotion, but they were the rare exception. The majority of Israel, they did not follow the commandments of the Lord. How, how many times did Israel celebrate the year of Jubilee? None, never, zip, zero. Why? They didn't want to give back any land that they had bought. <laughs> All of that was supposed to go back to the original owner, right? How are we doing? And we've got the Holy Spirit. But why is it so difficult? Because, listen to me, because every single day you have to follow Jesus' command, and he says, daily, take up your and follow me. The word of faith, you're, you're familiar with the word of faith doctrine? Prosperity gospel? Blab it and grab it, lip it and grip it, you know? You know the problem with that theology? The, the, the number one problem with that theology, they, they don't know what to do about suffering. They, they have no answer to suffering, to trials, to testings. Are you going to suffer in this life? Yeah. And you need, you need to have a proper understanding of God's purposes and plans in that suffering for you to get through that, to process that and, and come, out of the, come out on the other side whole. What happened to so many people that get shipwrecked when they enter into that, that word of faith nonsense? That you're never supposed to be ill. You're, you're supposed to be rich. How much is the, the Powerball jackpot? $1.9 billion. How many of you would like to win that today? Nobody? <laughs> there you go. There's an, honest, there's an honest man. What would you do with it? You'd give it to Pastor Rick, wouldn't you? 10% anyway. That's all we want. It's 10%. No. That, that kind of wealth will destroy you. Yeah. You understand that? That kind of wealth will destroy every single one of us. You do. We don't have the maturity to handle it. No. Well, next week, I'm going to finish the text, I promise. <laughs> you don't need lunch anyway. We're going we're gonna to enjoy the word. Listen. Next week, I'm going to do a topical message on waiting, because that's what we're doing on Sunday nights. We're waiting on the Lord. Okay, and then the following week, we'll start to go into the book of Acts. But, but, but God has wonderful purposes in our waiting. And sometimes that waiting is excruciating. The waiting itself can be suffering, you know. But there's a purpose in it all. 40 days he was resurrected. And then he said, now, now go to Jerusalem and how long did they have to wait? But did they know that? No. He just said, go wait. He told me, get on Sunday nights, meet with whoever wants to meet with you at 6 o'clock and come in the sanctuary and wait. I'm going to do something. But you need to wait. I don't know how long I got to wait. I don't know. He just said, wait. They had to wait 10 days. They didn't know how it was, it was going to be 10 days. Why wait the first day of the resurrection? Why didn't he do all of that and take care of it right then and there? They weren't ready. They weren't mature. 
They couldn't handle what he was going to do. No, Peter, listen, Peter, the leader of this, he had to be humbled. Yeah, I love that little kid's song, don't you? Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up, come on, sing it with me. Those who are weak, and may the prayer of my heart always be. Make me a servant, Lord. Humble me, Lord. Make me meek and humble. I, I, don't, I don't, listen, if you know anything about me, you know that that's not within my nature, but God wants to, me to be a new nature, his nature. He wants you. And sometimes it takes time, it takes waiting, and it takes suffering. Peter will never forget this. Oh, when he writes his epistle, he said, let me give you some reasons why if you add these things to your life, you will never, what? Stumble. stumble. You'll never stumble. Because he did. And he doesn't ever want it to happen again. Do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Busco arneon. Busco my arneon. And they said, what did he say? Feed my lambs. Busco means to provide nourishment, tenderness, strengthening, right? My, mu is the word here, mu, my, I own them. Who owns the lambs? Jesus. Feed my lambs, I own them. And this word for lambs, arneon, you know what it is? A lambkin. It's a little lamb, it's a baby lamb, it's a lambkin. Busco mi arneon. Oh, tenderly take care of them. Hold them close to you. We take great care of our little ones here. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's other churches that offer just as much as we offer, but no more. We love our children. Those little ones are learning of Jesus at their level, but they are protected. They are watched over. They are prayed for. We love our lambkins, right? That's a responsibility of every shepherd to provide good nourishment, not just for the flock, who may give a nickel or two, but for the children, the most innocent involved. This pagan culture in which we live, we have no regard for our children, slaughtering them in the womb, demanding the right to commit infanticide, to murder children, even up to the day of birth. How barbaric are we? Oh, and then when they come out of the womb, do you know that doctors now are taking children aside when they come, and without their parents' permission, the doctors are asking them, are you happy with your gender? Are you happy with who you are? Hospitals, teaching institutions, medical institutions that were renowned throughout the world now, providing mutilation surgeries for children? Think about this. Do we, do we nurture, do we take care of our lambkins? The, the safest place for every single human being for the first nine months of their existence is where? The womb. God is a nurturing God. Wednesday night we learned that as we went through the text that, that it, there's, a, there's a, a nurturing aspect of God. It's like the nurturing of an infant in the womb of its mother. How God nurtures us cares for us, keeps us. We do violence to our children today, psychologically, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. We're not taking care of our children. No. Pagans. We're pagans. I want you to understand that. I, you know, I, don't, I take no pleasure in saying this. It grieves me. I am vexed like righteous lot. But we have to admit the truth because we listen with our eyes and we see that we live in a pagan culture. Tuesday, everybody wants a political savior, don't they? Now listen, I'm going to vote. I told you to vote. It's your stewardship. It's your responsibility to vote. We live in a free society, and one of the privileges we have is the right to vote. Our vote should count. Our vote should count for some. Now, I can't help it if there's corruption. I can't help it if they steal the election. That's not, I'm not, that's not on me. But I have to vote. And I can tell you, I'm going to vote the right way. <laughs> Not the wrong way. 
But listen to me. Listen to me. I put no hope in a political savior. I put my hope in the savior of the world. Our society and, and, and most of the religious right are looking for prosperity and peace, but they don't want revival. They don't want the Lord ruling over their life, insisting that they manifest their love for him through the obedience of his word. How many call themselves by his name and are living completely disobedient to his will and know it and could care less? And again, verse 16, again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me, agapeo? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you, Lord. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Poineo probatan. Now, this means just, just take care of my older ones. You ever read uh, Philip Keller's uh, Shepherd's Look in the 23rd Psalm? Anybody ever read that? It's a wonderful read. I, I've read it several times over. It's just a wonderful read if you want to be refreshed in the great chief and good shepherd of the flock, Jesus, and his care for us personally. Read that book. This is a, a shepherd, a, a sheep, um, who is writing the book and giving you a wonderful understanding of the 23rd Psalm. What was the shepherd's responsibility in tending to the sheep? If some of you read that, what are some of the acts that the shepherd would conduct in order to tend the sheep? You had to have, you had to closely examine your sheep. You know, I, every Saturday, what's Saturday night? Bath night. I get a bath, so does the dog. <laughs> every Saturday night, Come no matter what, whether I need one or not, you know, but by Saturday I need one. But, but, <laughs> no. but every Saturday I bathe my dog. Every Saturday gives me the opportunity to really examine him, look him over, you know, I, you know. I mean, I got my hands on him, I'm touching him, I'm looking at him, you know, just see if there's any problems. I'm moving all his joints. I mean, just examine my dog. That's what the shepherd would do with the flock. He'd examine them for parasites, for any problems that they would have, any deformities, any injuries. Nothing. He's a good dog. Healthy dog. You take good care of him. I appreciate that. My shepherdess. What else? What else would the shepherd do? Oh, you got to protect him. He had a staff, right? His staff and, and the, the shorter, uh, my rod. Staff and my rod. The rod was a short instrument that he would throw at wolves or anybody else who would come in. David was a prime example. What did David do in risking his life to protect the sheep? He fought a bear, he fought a lion, and he fought the giant to protect God's sheep, right? Yeah. So there's, there's tend my sheep. You provide water, you provide food, you provide healing, you provide salve or balm. You know, uh, fleas or flies get all over their face, and so they put that, that balm, that grease uh, all over them so they can't be infected. I was out here working, pulling weeds yesterday, and I don't know how I got into it, but I was down in the gully right over there by the mailbox, and all of a sudden, I had gloves on. My hands were on. If you see a pair of gloves out there, don't touch them. <laughs> They're out there on the ground. But my hands were on fire. You know what was all over me? Red ants, fire ants. I threw those gloves off and I started doing a dance. Man. Oh, they're terrible, terrible. I'm sorry? Yeah, they're products of the fall. Demonic little creatures. They are, they are. Yeah. I don't know why I went there. Why did I go there? Where was I going with that? I don't know. Oh, you got to examine them. That's right. That's right. So you tend the sheep. And he said to him a third time, a third time now, Simon, Simon. You know, when my mother was upset with me, you know, she'd call me. She didn't call me Rit. Richard. You know, <laughs> that's when I'm upset with my son. I thought, Richard. Yeah. You know what your son did? That's what she would say. I don't know what is my son all of a sudden now. I thought... <laughs> A third time, do you love me? Now Jesus stoops down to Peter's level, and he doesn't use the word agape. Mm -hmm. Are you fond of me, really? Do you have an affection? I mean, is there a, a, a friendship, a brotherly love here between us? So, so Jesus comes down to his level. And then Peter responds, Yes, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Again, Busco provided the nourishment, strengthening my probatan, my adult sheep. So you feed the lambs and you feed the adults. The most important thing we can do as under-shepherds of Jesus Christ, I don't even consider myself an under-shepherd. You know what I am? Every good shepherd needs what I am. What am I? A sheepdog. Every good shepherd needs a sheepdog. That's what I am, right? But you have to provide that nourishment of the word of God, both to the little ones. Our little ones are taught. They're not entertained. They're taught the word of God. And providing nourishment to you. Too much of Christendom, with the emphasis upon the, are dumbed down. They don't know the Bible. They don't know the word of God. They, they don't have a good working knowledge of the scriptures at all. That's why they're all so deceived so easily. That's why the, these deceivers, these apostates can pull the wool over their eyes so easily. Because they don't know the word of God. I am so thankful for you all, good Bereans that you are. After I teach you, go home and you search the scriptures to see, are these things really so? Does he really know what he's talking about? It's important that you do that. Yes, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, well, no, wait a minute. Let's stop there for a minute. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter got it. And I hope that through the person of the Holy Spirit and his work in our life, we get it. Because he certainly did. He understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Peter was not the first pope. That's what Catholicism said. I come out of Romanism or Catholicism. And, and we were taught, I was taught as a child when I went through my catechism, that Peter was the first pope. Is Peter the first pope? No, no. And is, 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 is Jesus making Peter primacy over the others? No, no. I love what Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Are you there? For the elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am the Pope. Is that what he said? No, I'm who a fellow elder. We're just the best of men. We're men at best. That's all we are. That's all we are. But God uses us. Yes, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd who owns these sheep appears, you will receive the crown of glory which does not fade away. It is the love of Christ that constrains me, Paul would write, to do all that I do in ministry. It should be the love. A love is the motivator for everything that we should do in our response to knowing him more, loving him more, and serving him more. Peter's being strengthened now. How many times did he deny the Lord? And how many times is God giving him the opportunity to affirm his love? Three. Three. But the Holy Spirit is going to come on Peter on that day of Pentecost. Oh, I can't wait to get to that text. And he's going to be a new Peter, a different Peter. He's going to be a Peter that is so strengthened in his resolve, in his commitment, in his relationship with the Lord that nothing can separate, not even the fear of death. And that's what Jesus is going to reveal. To him. What, what Jesus reveals to Peter now had to be so reassuring for him. It had to be so comforting for him. You know, the Bible constantly encourages us. The Apostle Paul encouraging Timothy and the other young pastors to finish, finish well. Hey, there's a lot of people that start this race with us. And this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And they don't finish well. I, 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 in my mind's eye right now, I can see and hear many that I know and love. They haven't finished well. They haven't done well at all. I don't know about you. That's a fear that I have. I ask for your prayers. Even though I have a little platform, this little flock, I still have a target on my back. And I need your prayers. I want his keeping grace so that I can finish well the race that is set before me. And don't you wish that Jesus would give you absolute assurance that you will finish well? Well, we can be. As we stay in the word, right? Stay in prayer. Stay in the communion of the saints. We'll talk about that next week more, about the waiting. How do we wait? Where did I say go? 
Well, we already talked about that. Okay, go back to John 21. We're going to finish up. I know your stomachs are growling. Verse 18, Jesus speaking to Peter, Now most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wish. Self-determining. Self-governing. Is that where we are now? No. No, in everything that we do, every decision that we make, every desire of our heart, we need to say, Lord, thy will be done. What do you want, Lord? You walked where you wish, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you don't wish to go. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Take up your cross and follow me. That, that's, listen, Jesus doesn't give us a manual, an instruction book, and say, figure it out. You know, I, I'm not good at that. You know, but if you want me to learn something, show me, right? I was, I was taking drum lessons from Eric just to have some fun, right? But you were showing me how to do it. You didn't hand me an instruction book and say, okay, now just go ahead and let your stuff loose. It would have been just a lot of noise, right? All right, it was a lot of noise. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't leave us to ourselves to figure this out. He said, look, I'm going to go before you. All I ask you to do is follow me. But as I took up my cross, as I died for you, now I'm asking you to live sacrificially for me. I will wager to say the majority of you are fortunate if you know a handful of people who truly live a sacrificial life for Jesus. What does that mean? What is it that Jesus wants us to sacrifice? Our time. One at a time. What? Our time. Our time. Our time belongs to him. You know, God doesn't wear a watch. He doesn't even own one. <laughs> right? But he's never late, is he? No. And, and heaven, the joy about heaven is going to be timeless, right? Because it's not material. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. What else? What else does he want you to sacrifice? What? Money, money. money. I, all he asks for is a tenth, right? You know, you do it all day, wouldn't you, Nathan? If I, if we, next Sunday, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll give you $1,000, I want 100 back. And I'm going to do that every Sunday till the end of the year. Is that okay? We, 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 you like that deal? Huh? Yeah. See, God, see, God gives us 100% of what we have, and all he does is test our heart. Do you love me more than these? People spend more on their pets, on their fast food, than they do on the Lord a given month. What does that say? Your time, your money, what else? Your desires. Your desires, your heart. More than anything else, he wants your heart. My desire has to be for him. Not what he can do for me. I just want the Lord. That's what I'm praying for on Sunday night. I just want more of him to be manifest in my life than ever before. Peter, from this moment on, would live a life of complete sacrifice to the Lord, holding back nothing. The Apostle Paul gave us an example of what our relationship should be to unsaved family. And what should that be? You know, you've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. Anybody ever hear that? None of you have heard that? Yeah. Blood is thicker than water, right? Now, what's meant there is that the family's first, right? Family is the priority, right? But I want to suggest to you the spirit is thicker than blood. Spiritual family, the family of God. You're more my brothers and sisters than my biological brothers and sisters ever be. So they come to the Lord. But I have a communion with you. We're, we're in fellowship. We're in koinonia. The word koinonia, right? There's four words, English words in the Bible, in the New Testament that translate to koinonia. The koinonia is fellowship. The koinonia is partnership. The koinonia is sharing. The koinonia is communion. Do you realize that's what we are? We're in partnership in our purpose for serving God for the promotion of the gospel, for the sake of the lost. We're sharing one another's lives and resources and time and energies for the purposes that God would have for this body and for our outreach. 
we're contributing, we're in contribution. We give our resources. You know, John Michael, merely, this is a little church. You know, in just the last few years, you'd be amazed at how much we have given out. Last year's budget alone, 45% of everything we took in went out to mission. 45%. Wow. Sharing. And then lastly, communion. We're the body of Christ. We, this fellowship that we have, this communion that we have is that I belong to you and you belong to me. We're all connected one to another. Robert, you are my brother. I'm your brother. We are sons of the same man. We're family. More than our biological family ever will be. You understand that? Mm. So Peter is being absolutely assured that the next time, Peter, your life will be threatened. You will gladly give it up for my sake. You will never deny me again. Isn't it wonderful that God would give him that reassurance? Give him the opportunity to say, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you, but help me love you more. Oh, I, you probably never have, but since my salvation, I've disappointed God. I haven't done everything I'm supposed to do. And it sickens me when it happens. And I feel like Peter, but I know if I am faithful to confess my sin, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive me of all my sin and to cleanse me from all iniquity. To change my heart. To give me a new heart. Isn't that wonderful? Would you follow him? Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, would you say, Lord, just show me the cross I have to bear. Show me where I have to make a sacrifice today to follow you. You, 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 you can't be slavishly devoted to money, to your expectations, to your unsaved biological family, etc., etc., etc. You have to be slavishly devoted to Jesus. So tomorrow morning, you're probably going to get up and you're going to read your devotion, right? But I want to ask you to pray. Pray that God will give you the, the ability to live a devotional life. Peter couldn't do it in his own strength. Israel never did it. They didn't obey those commands, did they, in Deuteronomy? No, but God was showing them what the standard was. But they could never meet it. The law simply makes us aware of our absolute dependence upon Jesus, upon his Holy Spirit, to work within me both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You can only live to the glory of God through the power of his Holy Spirit. But you have to purpose that you want that. Which of you, which of you, as evil as you are, if your daughter asks you for an egg, we'll give her a serpent. If she asks you for bread, we'll give her a stone. You, being evil, know how to give gifts to your children, how much more your father who, who is in heaven. And then John explains that to us. What was he talking about? The power of the Holy Spirit to live a life for Christ. All you need do is ask, and God will empower you through his spirit to live in that newness of life. Peter was now, he went from Simon to being Petros, Peter, right? The rock. And so can we. You simply have to desire it. He'll never refuse you. He is a good father. If you ask for the empowering of the Holy Spirit, to live a sacrificial life, to understand the purposes and the plans of God in suffering, because we're going to suffer in this world. He's telling Peter, you're going to suffer persecution. Oh, they're all going to be persecuted except John. But John was persecuted. He just didn't die a martyr's death, but he was persecuted. And I want to suggest to you, in this pagan culture we're in right now, you are public enemy number one. Why? 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 Why are you public enemy number one? Because you embrace the truth. Our world today hates the truth. We have a president and an administration and a news media that lies to us on a continual basis, daily, multiple lies. They hate the truth. And Jesus said, it's no, it's no wonder the world hates you. It hated me first and my truth. And therefore, they're going to hate you. Please understand that. How do you deal with the suffering that's coming your way? How do you deal with persecution? Maybe we'll talk more about that next week. But you need to prepare for that. Because 
we're, we're going to be forced to make a decision. Capitulate to the state. We'll have a concert, and I'll give you a feel-good message, and we'll get along with the world. If you love the world, the Father has no part in you, right? Or, or you're going to go ahead and realize that that suffering and the persecution is meant for your perfection, for your maturity, for your strength. Yeah. Amen? Shall we stand? David, you got a closing song?